Good afternoon, everybody. Paul Russell here. Just letting you know that we'll wait a minute or two for others to join us. We're about halfway there at the moment. So we'll come back to you in about a minute. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome. With me, I'm pleased to say I have Absara Telawati. Hi. <laughs> welcome to today's Test Grid webinar on graduate recruitment in government. Absara, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about your background? Absolutely. So I'm an organisational development and consulting psychologist, and I primarily provide best practice advice and guidance about many organisational processes. Uh, most of these include psychometric testing and, and its impact on recruitment and selection. But I do other things, including employ, um, employee organisational and leadership development stuff, succession and workforce planning, and a, very, a, a variety of other organisational needs. Things. Um, I've been at Tesco's since 2012 in various different capacities, from being a placement student to a part-timer and now a full-timer, and I'm absolutely loving it here, largely because I work closely with so many different industries and on so many different great projects. Today, my role is really to provide support and assistance to Paul in this really exciting webinar for you guys today. Thanks, Absara. I certainly feel supported. And for all you graduate recruiters out there, it's interesting to know that Absara originally joined Test Grid from a vacation employment program. I did, yeah. <laughs> so a little bit about my background. I was actually in the Australian Public Service in federal government for nearly 30 years. And through the majority of that time, I worked right across human resources. I worked in five different departments and agencies, so I got a good overview of the APS. I've always maintained a strong interest in recruiting, developing and ret retaining graduates. I guess it's been a bit of a passion of mine. I was also the former chair of the Australian Association of Graduate Employers or Recruiters, and I think you'd know the abbreviation AAGE. For the last 15 months, I've worked with Test Grid across all levels of government federal, state and local. So just briefly, a little more about Test Grid. Test Grid's been providing assessment services for nearly 16 years now. We have a library of over 250 different assessments and tests from over 20 different test publishers right around the world. We also have a strong team of psychologists, including Absara, <laughs> who look at individual or generic job descriptions or roles. Our team of sites then provide options and recommendations on how to proceed. 
they are not wedded to any single assessment. And I think that's the point of difference about Test Group. Therefore, our clients get the best possible solutions. Anyhow, enough on Test Group. Let me just fill you in on today's format for our webinar. We will have time at the end of the webinar for questions. Please use your question box to send us questions and we'll cover those off at the end. You will also receive a very short survey on today's webinar. We would encourage you to complete this because it will provide Sarah and I with feedback. There's also an opportunity for you to ask any additional questions uh, and we can also forward you a copy of the webinar should you wish. So let's set the scene. Okay. Um, this slide is probably of particular relevance for federal government, but there's plenty in here for state and local government as well. Let's go back to late October 2013 in the Australian Public Service. Senator Erica Betts announced interim recruitment arrangements for federal government and that was great news for state and local governments because what that meant was that there was an increased talent pool of graduates, there was more choice for state and local government and it also alleviated the need for many grads to have to relocate to Canberra. So it was a real win for state and local governments. A snapshot of 2014, there was little external APS recruitment with the exception of entry level recruitment and that was mainly grads. Entry level recruitment remained uncertain in federal government and the final decision on recruitment of graduates rested with the government. In fact, the Prime Minister approved the graduate intake of 1,500 in 2014. That was down up to 50% on previous years. So a significant decline in graduates coming into uh, the APS in 2015. Again, this represents a great opportunity for state and local government. In many cases, the top talent was just sitting there waiting for offers to be made. The outcome of this was that the APS lost uh, many of its talented grads, about 15%, they sought opportunities elsewhere. There was also the issue of grads receiving up to eight offers from departments and agencies once the permission was given to go and make formal offers. This was carried out within a 48 hour window. So again, it placed a lot of pressure on graduates and a lot of pressure on graduate recruitment managers. So that brings us to the middle of March 2015. Agencies have been requested by the Australian Public Service Commission to submit their 2016 graduate recruitment numbers. A lady by the name of Tanya Puckett at the, age, at the APSC is responsible for uh, compiling these numbers for government. Tanya's details are included towards the end of our presentation. If there are any government agencies out there who haven't submitted their numbers to Tanya at the APSC, I would encourage you to do so as a matter of urgency as a formal letter is going to government on, on this very issue. Today we are facing a few challenges. Uh, we don't know the approval process in detail. Uh, at the federal government level, there's a poss another possibility or further opportunity for state and local governments to cash in on being able to have more choice as far as graduates are concerned. Uh, it's critical that government recruit on merit. It's important to rec recognise and recruit a diverse workforce. And the APS has introduced special measures provisions for Indigenous an entry level recruitment and an entry level recruitment process known as recruitability for candidates with special needs. Let me outline a scenario for you. This scenario will be relevant to you all. Only the scale will differ. 
you are all graduate recruitment managers working for a service delivery organisation. You have been tasked by management to recruit 30 new grads. Traditionally, your organisation receives between 1,200 and 1,500 applications. How can a graduate cost so, money, so much money? Holistically, from attraction through to the completion of a development program, it can cost some departments and agency upwards of $150,000. And that's all related to costs from the moment you start your attraction program to the time almost two years further down the track that the graduate actually completes their, their first year working in your government business. Some of the costs would include attraction costs, attendance at recruitment fairs, screening costs such as shortlisting, testing and assessment, the costly design, development, delivery of assessment centres, not to mention venues and catering, interviewing, um, setting up a robust metric system to actually measure and record your statistics. All government agencies are required to do security vetting, police checks, medicals, referee checks. Government has an extended offers process. Many government agencies assist grads with relocation and rental assistance. Uh, onboarding, induction, training, learning and development and grad programs are also costly. Some government departments and agencies do supervisor and buddy training. And then there's the sunk costs of internal recruitment, the cost of the team and the resources that they consume, not to mention outsourcing. You can understand how the dollars add up. Based on our scenario with 30 graduates, you could look upwards of four and a half million dollars for this exercise. So imagine if three graduates leave the program, that's 10% of your intake or nearly half a million dollars. Test Grid's best practice approach, and we've skipped a few steps here, uh, this is where your decision as graduate recruitment managers count. Let me draw your attention to the figures on the left hand side in black. These are based on our scenario that we've just recently spoken about. These are estimates based on ratios that can be tailored to your department or agency's requirements. We, ha we have approximately 1,200 applicants. Our objective is to reach the best possible 30 graduates based on merit. These graduates will require a passion and have the best possible fit with your organisation. So the first thing that you would do would be to look at mandatory screening of, of applications. One good area to sort on is Australian citizenship. <clears throat> this can be addressed in the application process by graduates having to formally sign a declaration or upload proof or upload documentation. Other forms of mandatory screening may include licences, qualifications, certificates, a GPA scores or perhaps fluency in a language. This process will traditionally screen out 5 to 10 per cent of applicants. I'll now, now hand over to Absara who will give you some more information about cognitive ability and why that's important. Thanks Paul. So typically we find that our government clients like to do a phone screen immediately after applications have been initially reviewed. At Test Grid we're all about the best practice so we believe in psychometrically sound and merit-based processes. So when it comes to the best practice approach in cognitive um, and other psychometric testing, we believe that the implementation of cognitive ability assessments at this point instead of a phone screen is the best approach. There are two main uh, reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is because phone screening costs a lot in terms of the bottom line as well as people and resource hours. Now when we think about the volume of applications, 
uh, in the scenario that Paul has explained, it just makes sense to filter out candidates with cognitive ability scores that are outside of what we want before we go ahead and spend more time and resources getting to know our candidates better. Now this method actually ends up being a little bit more cost effective because it enables your resources to quickly and easily shortlist candidates based on their cognitive ability rather than a subjective review of their over the phone responses. Now the second reason for why we believe that this process is better is because of the alignment with the merit principle. And this really highlights something that I mentioned in my last point and that is that using an objective tool such as cognitive ability assessments um, to filter out candidates who don't meet certain standards as opposed to responses to preset questions over the phone which are ultimately reviewed subjectively anyway, this process enables candidates to be compared to one another using a fair and equitable methodology. From here, we recommend the use of a video interviewing tool. Now you can think of this as a more advanced phone screen uh, or a replacement of the phone screen because it really does mitigate some of the key issues associated with the phone screen. By using the video interview tool at this point, all candidates who were shortlisted based on their cognitive ability scores uh, then go ahead and respond to preset questions with a preset time to respond to each question. And already you can see one of the key benefits there, and that is that having a preset amount of time to respond to a question, all candidates are treated the same, and there is no uh, issues associated with candidates waffling on and taking up too much time. They are straight to the point and don't stumble across the, uh, the right answer through their waffles. Um, now because each video interview is recorded and is not live, it also means that many raters from different recruitment streams um, have the opportunity to review each candidate and rate them um, both qualitatively and quantitatively based on agreed upon criteria. And this also means that any queries or follow-up that's required for particular candidates um, in terms of having an extra pair of eyes to review a candidate can also be done, which is not something that can be done with a live telephone screen. Finally, decision makers can go back to uh, each of the candidates and review the objectivity of raters uh, and ensure that a merit-based approach has been adhered to. Now, some of our government clients argue that placing the video interview before the cognitive ability testing is more cost effective. And in theory, yes it is, but that is only if you're looking at a price per test only. Now going back to the scenario that, um, that Paul has pointed out and the figures that we have on the left hand side there, uh, if we move the video interview before the cognitive ability testing, we're looking at maybe a five to 10 minute video interview per candidate, and that's 1,100 candidates, um, with at least two raters, or the best practice, which is three or more reviewers per candidate. And of course, the more reviewers we have, the um, reliability of our ratings does increase, which assists with um, ensuring consistency in ratings. So if we say we've got three raters per video interview, so per um, 1,100 video interviews. I can't even do that calculation, Paul, but it, it all adds it's up. It's a lot. It? <laughs> okay, so from here, the best practice approach stipulates that we um, use an assessment centre at this point. Um, and this is really just a really great opportunity to see shortlisted candidates in a live setting, that is both interacting with others as well as uh, individually. Now, if a behavioural or personality assessment is undertaken at the same time as a cognitive ability assessment, as I've got there in the second stage on the slide, depending on which assessment is selected, that may also be a cost saver too. Now, you can certainly contact TestGrid after this session if you'd like to hear more about this, but in short, there are some behavioural or personality assessments that we have available that you can put your candidates through at the front end, and that will facilitate their candidate experience by only logging on once and doing the assessments in one sitting. And then once you've shortlisted your candidates and invited them to an assessment centre or a structured behavioural interview, you'll only get charged for the personality or behavioural assessments that you choose to download. Now note again that this isn't the case for all behavioural or personality assessments. Uh, and certainly um, do feel free to tune in to our next webinar where we'll talk a little bit more about new developments in the assessment centre space. Uh, from here we move into the final offer stage and I sort of come back to a note that Paul had mentioned regarding us sort of 
um, keeping the process shorter here. Um, obviously, there are so many other stages after this final offer. Um, but Paul, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I think just picking up on your comments, Sarah, around video, I think one of the real advantages in video is you get both qualitative and quantitative assessment. With video, qualitative allows you a free text box to record the suitability of the candidate on a designated criteria, whilst quantitative assessment just means you can provide a simple mm. numeric score yeah. based on the candidate's response. I also think video is usual useful for uh, development purposes. You, a graduate coordinator as far as placements or rotations can use a video to look and see where the graduate's interests lie. Uh, they can also be forwarded to the graduate's first uh, rotation supervisor so the supervisor can actually get an understanding or an appreciation of the graduate's strengths mm -hmm. and what their work interests might be and perhaps they can actually design their rotation around some of that to fulfil some of the graduate's expectations. Some good points that you raised there, Paul. Fantastic. So the next slide is all about the benefits of uh, using psychometric assessments in your recruitment process. Now this applies to both graduate recruitment as well as broader organisational recruitment. The first point um, is a really standout point is that psychometric assessments provide a valid method which can increase the chances of making good hiring decisions and increase diversity by decreasing what we know to be as like hires and that's really aligned with the merit principle. Uh, next, um, psychometric assessments allow objective validation of information gathered at other stages of the recruitment process. And those other stages could involve uh, assessment centres, referee checks, structured behavioural interviews and so on. I think the point that I'd like to make here though is that each psychometric assessment that you do, whether it's a verbal reasoning or numerical reasoning abstract, whether it be personality or so on and so forth, each of these assessments provide one data point only. And one data point equals one piece of the puzzle that is the candidate. The next point here is that it helps to inform and structure a structured behavioural interview. Um, and again, that's based on information that you've gathered. Um, and you can identify potential, motivation, talent, skills, um, and other things that are relevant uh, and very um, important to a specific and given role which can obviously further assist in the recruitment and selection process. You can also identify areas of, um, of development. And of course, if you choose to proceed with a candidate, um, you'll obviously have information pertaining to their development areas, which will provide you with clear guidance for what areas to target and focus on in their upskilling. It provides a standardised measure of comparison of candidates and provides reliable criteria for ranking and deciding between candidates. So that's comparing apples with apples. Um, and finally, when used correctly, these psychometric assessments provide a legally defensible method to support your selection decisions. Was there anything that you wanted to add there, Paul? I think that's very comprehensive. <laughs> okay. So I guess it's time for a brief summary. And again, if you've got any questions, please forward them to us now. So in summarising, I'd say a holistic approach uh, to graduate recruitment, the government, very important. Think of the big picture, think of the costs, think of the candidate's long-term suitability and viability, which will lead to greater retention. Um, we mentioned earlier that Australian citizenship is a mandatory field, but uh, one key takeaway point, if you don't take away anything else from this session, is that things like culture fit and cognitive capacity to perform the role that you're trying to, um, to fulfil in your graduate recruitment process are critical. So um, please keep those front of mind. Touch points. I think that they're really important. I think the more touch points you have throughout your graduate recruitment process, the better the candidate alignment will be. And I think that will lead to the graduate hitting the ground running. And I think that will also lead to you retaining that grad for a longer period, given that best fit situation. And I think to touch on uh, something that Paul mentioned earlier regarding um, retention and, and attrition 
through the recruitment process to help you to maximise retention during that recruitment process. It's really important to provide candidates with as much information as possible throughout the entire recruitment process. And that can, in, that can involve things like a realistic job preview or um, access to position descriptions or even uh, conversations with grads from previous years or previous cohorts um, and that information will not only benefit the graduates and helping them to select in or, or opt out uh, of the recruitment process but also your organisation in the long term. That's right. So we mentioned a couple of people further earlier in our pre presentation. My contact details and Absar's contact details are there as is those of Ben Reeves, who's the CEO of the Australian Association of Graduate Employers. Uh, both his email and mobile numbers are there. Graduate Careers Australia, they provide graduate recruiters with very useful information on their website with regard to campus recruiting. Uh, they've got a section there on their website where you can go for the names, addresses, emails, telephone numbers of each of the career services at each of the campuses across Australia of all the different universities. So that's a great source, a primary source for you. Uh, Tanya Puckett, as I mentioned, uh, she works at the Australian Public Service Commission and she's uh, collating at the moment contact, uh, the numbers of grads for the 2016 APS intake for next year. She has to report to Minister Abetz on that. Uh, Carolyn was. Uh, Carolyn works for the National Association of Graduate Careers Advisory, Advisory Services or the AHE equivalent for career services. Uh, again, they're a national body and they have a conference in December every year and employers are free to attend that conference and are encouraged to do so and you can actually network with 40 plus career services from around Australia, so it's a great opportunity. Uh, Dan, he has uh, just started in immigration and he's, one of his responsibilities is to provide secretariat services for the Graduate Managers Forum or the GMF. That's a networking consultative body uh, for public service departments and that meets on a quarterly basis. So if you're not a member of, a G of the GMF, I would encourage you to join if you're an APS department or agency. So some key contacts and again, if you would like that, uh, copy of that slide and all the other slides that you've seen today, please don't hesitate to indicate that on your survey form. Okay, now it's time for questions and we actually do have a couple of questions which is encouraging. So we've got a question uh, asking what is the difference between cognitive and psychometric testing? Uh, so to answer your question, um, cognitive ability assessments are typically the psychometric assessments. So psychometric assessments refer to assessments that have been validated um, for their reliability, um, that is that they consistently measure what it what they intend to measure and how valid they are. That is, they measure what they intend to measure. Um, we actually run some training around uh, introduction to psychometric testing, so um, happy to talk you through some of that stuff as well. Um, but cognitive testing, so cognitive ability testing, um, is a type of psychometric testing. So with cognitive ability uh, testing, there's various different types of abilities that we can assess. Typically, um, in government, we look at verbal reasoning, numerical or quantitative reasoning, uh, abstract reasoning, and diagrammatic reasoning. Um, aside from that, there are things like spatial, visual, mechanical reasoning, and I mean, those things are probably more um, appropriate or suitable for uh, engineers or um, architects or those kinds of roles. Um, so depending on the role and the nature of the work, uh, different types of cognitive ability assessments are um, more appropriate. Okay. Sarah, I've got a question here is, what is your take on a similar situation with the federal government should the APS not be able to make offers until later in the year? That's an interesting question. So I guess 
departments and agencies in Canberra would be in a position of having to keep them warm for longer. Uh, so one of the first things I would recommend uh, agency recruiter doing is staying in touch with the Australian Public Service Commission on a regular basis. Tenure Pucket could be your new best friend. <laughs> um, I would keep a close eye on social media, especially Whirlpool, to see what's being said because your agency may be in a position to clarify um, subjective statements on things like Whirlpool or Facebook or, or Twitter. Um, you could send out regular emails to the graduates that are involved in your recruitment process, keeping them apprised of the situation and of any changes or of progress or uh, estimates of when final offers might be able to be made. Uh, you might seek permission from your internal delegate to indicate uh, roughly the order of merit or whether an applicant is highly suitable or just suitable or the likelihood of them receiving an offer from your agency. Uh, you may be able to provide some initial feedback to the graduate, uh, even some development options. So there are ways of keeping the graduate engaged and keeping them warm should a repeat of last year's process occur again. And so we've got one more question. I think this might be the last question, or it's certainly the last question I have. And it's around graduates opting in and opting out and whether recruiters offer graduates positions. Not quite sure what <laughs> what the gist of that is, but I I think the way I would read that would be that certainly government recruiters do offer grads positions. Um, but graduates also have a choice about what agencies are suitable for them. And I think a lot of factors contribute to graduates making decisions. Uh, I think graduates are influenced by the quality and the professionalism of the recruitment process and the assessment process. I think graduates look at the learning and development and the graduate development program opportunities that the department or agency offers. Certainly the type and the quality of on-the-job work that they might re receive, the quality of the managers, uh, certainly career progression plays a role. Like I've certainly known grads to ring up um, and talk to grads who have worked in the agency for two or three years and talk to them about their career progression. Um, certainly things like relocation assistance and any top form of assistance packages uh, form, form a role. Uh, there is also um, partner and relationship considerations, um, ageing parents. Um, a lot of these can also be monitored on Whirlpool and other social media sites. Um, I think grads draw upon their own experiences as well and where they where they are looking to be in five or ten years' mm. time. So I think that some of those things, um, certainly grads are looking for answers to those questions. And I think that um, if agencies can provide answers to those questions, well, you're well on your way to securing a grad. Yeah. There's another question there, Paul. Can you offer parts of the process, for example, testing, video interviews, but not assessment centres? Well, absolutely. Uh, part of the service that Test Group provide uh, is that we do elements of the testing process. So absolutely, that can involve just psychometric testing or just video interviews. Um, part of what we do here uh, in the psychology team is that we review um, what you've got to date, uh, what your preference is, what you've um, done before and what you'd like to do, um, and take all of those bits and pieces um, together to formulate uh, a best practice approach for you. And if that means that you're not doing an assessment centre, um, we do have solutions uh, around that as well. 
Yeah, I think that's quite important, Apsara. I think on one of our earlier slides, we actually spoke about tailoring the, a recruitment exercise mm. to each department in each agency's individual requirements. And I think that's exactly right. I think that's how you get the best possible solution and the best possible outcome for the department and agency. Yeah. And the scenario that we went through is, is just a scenario. Um, for many of you, your situations individually will not be like that at all. You may have more graduates to recruit, you may have far less. So of course, your whole process will have to change accordingly. Well, I think that brings us to the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you, Absaro, for participating. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. And as we said earlier, we'll be sending you out a, a short survey uh, to seek feedback on today's webinar. But there's also the opportunity to ask further questions of Absaro or myself and also to request a copy of today's video uh, webinar. So thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in the near future on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye.